this uh, portion of uh, the program on uh, uh, project management overview, what I'd like to do is to focus on some of the key people issues that we encounter when we talk about uh, managing projects. Uh, specifically, uh, the, some of the topics that I'll be covering uh, here will include, include things like uh, uh, what are some of the traits of uh, effective project managers, uh, what are the uh, competencies that we associated with uh, effective, that we associate with effective project uh, workers, whether they're project managers or other team members, and uh, also we'll be uh, taking a look at the uh, uh, project management professionalism and the perspective of the Project Management Institute on uh, <clears throat> what it is that uh, project managers and other project professionals uh, should be aware of, what they should know uh, uh, as they do their project management work. So uh, those will be the uh, th that'll be the items that we'll be covering on uh, that we'll be focusing on in this uh, uh, section. Let me uh, first talk about characteristics of people uh, who uh, are effective in working in project environments. Now, in a previous discussion, we saw that, by definition, projects are about achieving results, and that uh, when we discussed that, uh, we saw that people who gravitate to management positions in the project management area tend to be people who are obsessed uh, with the, the achievement of results. So, uh, one of the uh, major characteristics that we can identify with effective project professionals is that they are results-oriented. Uh, I think uh, that many people uh, are less concerned with producing physical results than operating in environments where you're going through routine types of processes. Uh, most uh, office environments that we encounter are fundamentally reactive, okay, uh, where managers react to uh, inputs that come to them from the environment on the outside or from within the organization and uh, basically their job is to conduct certain fundamental processes, get budgets together, uh, plan uh, <coughs> weekly meetings, these kinds of things and so on and so forth. Uh, it's not though about producing deliverables. Uh, project professionals are primarily producing deliverables. That's the results that we're talking about. Okay, so uh, that's a, a major uh, characteristic. Uh, another characteristic is that uh, project professionals uh, have to be able to focus on the details of project work at the same time uh, while keeping track of the big picture. Okay, the view from, they have to be able to view the project both from the 35,000 foot level uh, as well as the 5,000 foot level, simultaneously. Uh, not easy to do. Very few of us have personalities that allow us to, to zoom in and zoom out uh, 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 in our views of the project uh, that readily. Another key characteristic of uh, uh, project professionals is that they have to have a high tolerance for ambiguity. This uh, may seem strange at first because I think people who aren't really familiar with what happens on projects tend to think of project management uh, as, a, as a profession where everything is planned very carefully, almost like launching some kind of military operation, where uh, all the details are planned, uh, are planned out carefully, and then fundamentally we implement uh, to the plan. Uh, anyone who's been involved in military operations know, knows that the fundamental rule of, uh, of uh, implementing military plans is that within the first few moments of battle uh, the plan is no longer valid. Uh, what really becomes important even in military operations is uh, 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 developing people who know the general mission that the, uh, that the organization or the project, in the case of projects, the, the, the basic mission that, that needs to be achieved, uh, to have experience to know how to operate flexibly uh, in situations uh, that arise 
where you didn't uh, anticipate their, 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 uh, their, they, uh, these, these things happening, this kind of a situation. So uh, uh, it turns out then, uh, uh, people who are going to be effective in a project environment have to be able to cope with high levels of ambiguity. As we saw when we discussed the definition of what is a project, we saw projects are unique. So every project is different in some respect from every other project. And even on fairly routine projects where you think you've experienced everything that could possibly happen, uh, you find on a new project suddenly some things are different. Okay, and uh, 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 things aren't as clear as you thought they, they were going to be. So uh, uh, that's, a, that's an important trait of uh, effective project professionals, a high tolerance for ambiguity. Tied to that is uh, uh, the, the high tolerance to, uh, for ambiguity is uh, also a need that uh, effective project professionals have uh, uh, that they don't get disappointed very easily. Uh, if you get disappointed easily and things are constantly going wrong, and Murphy's Law tells us they will be going wrong, uh, uh, then uh, you're going to uh, get discouraged and you're not going to be able to do effective project work. So uh, it uh, is very helpful if you have a good sense of humor. Most of the top gun project managers that I've worked with over the years, these are people who've managed to carry out uh, major project responsibilities, hundreds of millions of dollars of responsibility, and, and they've been able to do a good job running major projects for, for many years. Um, all these people uh, have a good sense of humor. Uh, they realize that uh, if you take things uh, too seriously, uh, especially uh, when things go wrong, uh, you're going to be uh, eaten up. So it's uh, better to uh, be a little bit philosophical, have a good sense of humor, and recognize that uh, for every two steps you go forward, uh, it's, it's often the case that you've got to go uh, one step back. Now, if you've noticed, uh, in discussing uh, these various traits of uh, uh, effective project professionals, I haven't said, uh, well, they've got to be technically excellent. And uh, uh, that's one of the big debates we've had in project management for a long, long time. To what extent do effective project professionals, particularly those who are leading the project, need to be uh, technically sharp? And uh, uh, the answer to that question is, uh, is, is not very clear-cut. As I said just a moment ago, you better have a high tolerance for ambiguity. Uh, for the most part, uh, actually executing a project uh, as the project manager should not be a major technical undertaking. Uh, the project manager's job is to make sure that the resources are in place, that the plans are in place, uh, that the people uh, have the right kinds of attitudes and skills and abilities to ultimately achieve the results that we're striving to achieve. That's really what it's about. Uh, sometimes having uh, good political skills is ten times more important than being technically capable. So uh, there's, uh, to deal with the ambiguity of the project environment, uh, to deal with the fact that many of the people who are on your team are borrowed resources who don't want to be there. Okay, so that you need to have good motivation skills to get these people excited about the project. You begin seeing uh, that the, some of the technical issues uh, aren't as important as many people uh, tend to think when they first get involved with project management. Now, uh, there are exceptions to the rule. Uh, for example, on major state-of-the-art scientific projects, uh, it often is a requirement that you have someone with a very high technical reputation lead the team not because their technical skills are needed to solve the problems as such but because uh, if you're going to have the team members follow somebody uh, they want to make sure they're following someone who's perceived to be excellent and uh, so uh, they want, they want uh, the person who's leading the team, the technical team members want the person who's leading the team to be someone who's had a lot of experience dealing with the kinds of struggles and technical issues that, that uh, they, the team members, are encountering uh, during the course of a project. So there are occasions when technical expertise of the project leader, the project manager, uh, may be required, but it's primarily uh, for, for motivational purposes, for psychosocial purposes, uh, and not uh, because the, uh, you need the, the person who's running the project to be 
technically, uh, heavily technically involved. In fact, uh, one of the big problems we have in project management, particularly with engineering and information technology projects, is that project managers sometimes see themselves as being the, uh, the technical lead of the project and they start micromanaging the team, telling the team members uh, technically what they should be doing and this can, they can get in the way of progress. Okay, now uh, ultimately uh, I guess that when we're asking, well, what kind of technical skills should the project manager have, ultimately the answer has to be uh, dependent on the circumstances you're facing. Uh, certainly, uh, as we just saw, there are times when it's uh, important, uh, it may be important to have a, a good technical reputation, anyhow, to get people to follow you. On other occasions, uh, uh, having good uh, customer relations skills, good uh, team building skills, uh, good resource uh, uh, acquiring skills may be far, far more important skills to have than somebody who's technically sharp. Let's carry the discussion of uh, what we're looking for in, in uh, project professionals a little uh, farther now. And uh, I'd like to spend a, a few mo moments talking about uh, project management competence. And uh, I've written a book on this in this area. It's called Project Management Competence. And it's based on a, a, a couple of years of research I did uh, in the area of, uh, of, uh, of competence. Uh, back in the early 1990s through the uh, mid-1990s, uh, I was uh, Director of Certification for the Project Management Institute uh, for a six-year period of time, uh, the very beginning January of 1990 through uh, January of 1996. And during these six years, uh, I was dealing uh, six days, seven days a week with uh, issues of uh, assessing competence of project professionals uh, I was dealing with this, as I said, all week long, even weekends. I was dealing with it several hours a day. And uh, I was uh, directing the project uh, management certification effort as a volunteer. At the time I was a professor, and this is uh, some volunteer work I was doing. But during those six years, I had a, a chance to get involved with many people who have given a lot of thought to uh, what project management competence is. Uh, I also was in charge of maintaining an instrument, the certification examination, uh, whose uh, uh, focus was on trying to assess knowledge base competence in project management. And uh, uh, so uh, uh, I was uh, in a situation where uh, I began thinking very heavily about what does competence mean in a project management uh, environment. Uh, Towards the end of the 1990s, after I'd stepped down as certification director, I spent a couple of years uh, working on this book on project management competence, bringing together my experience as director of certification, uh, other experience I had back in the 1960s and 70s and 80s as, a, as a, someone very heavily involved with evaluation of technical and non-technical programs, and uh, based also on some more recent research I had been doing on competence. And uh, let me share with you then my conclusions. Let me share with you the, the basic thrust of what I write about in the book. Um, first of all, when we talk about project management competence, we have to recognize we're really talking about uh, uh, competence at three levels. Now, most of us, when we talk about project management competence, focus on competence at the level of the individual, the individual project professional, the team members, the project leaders, these kinds of people. And this is certainly an important area uh, for exploration, competence of individual people. Okay. Now, there are two other era levels of competence that we need to focus on as well if we're going to be competent as organizations, teams, individuals, in doing our project work, and I just mentioned the other two levels. You need to have competence at the level of teams, and you need to have competence at the level of the organization. So project management competence is really, if you visualize three circles, uh, each circle reflecting one of these levels of competence, is really three circles intersecting. You have the competence of the 
individuals, you have competence of teams, you have competence of the organization. Now, think why it's necessary to uh, approach competence in this way. Uh, it's pretty obvious when you reflect on it. Uh, certainly, uh, if we're going to have project management competence in our operations, we need to have good people. Okay, we need to have competent individuals. And uh, uh, the, in project management, competent individuals can be, uh, the competence of individuals can be broken into three sub-areas of competence. Uh, one sub-area of competence for individuals is uh, knowledge-based competence. Do the individuals who are working on uh, the project team uh, know uh, the basic tools and techniques of project management? Do they know the basic principles? Uh, do they know what a project is? Do they know how to schedule projects using techniques like PERT charts and Gantt charts and milestone charts? Those would be the knowledge-based competencies very specifically associated with uh, doing project work. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's those competencies, the knowledge-based competencies, that the Project Management Institute's certification exam focuses on. If you take and pass the Project Management Institute's certification exam, this is telling the world at large that you know your stuff in terms of the knowledge associated with project management uh, practice. Uh, you know uh, uh, the basic knowledge. Uh, you have insights in, uh, on how to do scheduling, uh, on how to do uh, resource allocations, on uh, risk management, contract management, and so on and so forth. So there are some core knowledge uh, competencies that you should uh, be familiar with, and by passing the exam, it's, a, it's, a, it's an outward and visible sign that, that you have some mastery of the knowledge-based competencies. But this doesn't mean that you can actually effectively run a team or a project. Okay, so it's not enough just to have a lot of book knowledge in your head. Uh, you also have to have social skills. So that's the second area of individual competence that, uh, that needs to be developed. Social skills. The capacity to lead people. Uh, the capacity to manage conflict when it arises and conflicts constantly arising on projects. Uh, the, uh, the, the capacity to empathize uh, with, with other people, okay, even uh, people you don't particularly like, to be able to see things from their point of view, uh, not to run around being angry uh, at people all the time. Okay, so these are, these are some of the uh, uh, social skills that you need to have. Uh, remember, in uh, actually running a project, if you're a project leader or a project manager, most of your energy is not going to be sitting down uh, at a computer with spreadsheets working on, uh, on your, your budgets and your schedules and uh, resource allocations. If you're spending all your time on the computer uh, computing budgets and schedules and resource allocations, who's running the project? Uh, most of your time is dealing with people, uh, trying to get them to perform in the way they're supposed to perform, trying to acquire resources, trying to talk to functional managers to get their uh, cooperation uh, to help you work with your team members and to get more of the more of the good people that you need to have to get your job done. So uh, uh, certainly the knowledge-based competencies are important, uh, but so are the social skills competencies. Even here, uh, I don't think uh, that's enough. I think you also have to focus on developing a third area of individual comp competence, and uh, that's what I call business sense. This doesn't mean that you need to go out and get an MBA to be effective in leading project teams and managing projects. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is, though, that you have basic business sense as you're out there uh, doing project work. Business sense, for example, means that you recognize that if you have a, uh, let's say, uh, you have a high-paid engineer who's being uh, loaned to your team for four days, they, you don't have that engineer uh, sitting down answering telephones. Uh, uh, even if you're missing someone to answer the phones, it's much more cost effective to hire some temporary worker to answer the phones than to have this engineer's uh, time uh, mis, uh, misappropriated. Okay, common business sense means uh, that you recognize uh, uh, that uh, ultimately on your project, 
uh, uh, you have to be sensitive to the fact that the revenue that the project will, that will bring the organization has to exceed the costs. I mean, profit is revenue minus cost. Just recognizing that uh, you uh, <clears throat> sometimes, uh, especially technical people, say, "Well, you can never spend too much uh, in order to have a good technical uh, uh, product." And the answer is, of course, you can spend too much. You can spend your organization into bankruptcy. So, uh, with business sense, we're talking about just common sense, uh, the, the kind of common sense that someone who's uh, even running a hot dog stand might have, that they want to be running that hot dog stand and staying in business, there's certain basic business issues that they have to contend with uh, in order to, uh, to survive and do well. So, uh, to recapitulate, uh, competence at the level of the individual uh, really falls into three uh, areas. Uh, there's got to be knowledge-based competence on project management knowledge. Uh, you need to have uh, uh, good uh, uh, social skills. You've got to be competent in that sense to be able to deal with other people because you're going to be dealing with other people all the time on your project. And then also you have to have good business sense. The second area of competence uh, that I mentioned earlier is uh, competence uh, uh, of, the, of the team itself. And uh, very little work has been done in this area. Uh, lots and lots of work has been done on assessing competence of individuals in various ways. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, we have this certification exam. It's been around for uh, just about two decades now. And uh, it does a pretty good job of assessing the competence of individuals. Uh, we don't have a, a lot of insights on how do you assess team competence. Now, what do we mean by team competence? Well. We recognize it's not enough just to have a bunch of smart people working together uh, to achieve some project goals as a, as a team. Uh, the issue is, are they really a team in the sense that uh, they can work together in a collaborative fashion, that their major concern is uh, by working together that they can achieve a lot more than if they try to work alone. Uh, also, uh, uh, Katz and Bax and Smith, uh, uh, book called The Wisdom of Teams, which is probably the, the best-selling book of all time on teams and team building, points out that uh, ultimately uh, a competent team, an effective team, is one that's able uh, to achieve its performance goals. Uh, having a good team doesn't mean that at the end of the day the team members sing songs together and hug each other and shake hands. Uh, having an effective team fundamentally means that these people can work together uh, to do a great job in achieving the performance objectives. So uh, what we need then to do is to have competent teams in the sense of uh, clusters of people who work together uh, to, uh, uh, to meet the project goals, to achieve the performance objectives. In assessing team-based competence then, some of the things you want to look at, uh, for example, is the attitude of the team players. Uh, do they have a good attitude to the project, towards the project? Do they have a good attitude towards each other? Uh, we also want to look at things like uh, do uh, the team members, each of them, do the things they're supposed to do? Even little things. Uh, does someone, uh, when you're holding team meetings, do you find that uh, George always arrives uh, ten minutes late to the meeting? Always. If, if George is always arriving late, this is not a good sign. It indicates that uh, George does not respect the time of the other people, this kind of a thing. So uh, this idea then of assessing team confidence gets a little tricky because it deals with a lot of psychological uh, factors and uh, 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 it deals with factors of uh, organizational and group behavior. Uh, the third level of confidence is uh, assessing confidence at the organizational level. And here, we've actually had a lot of work done over the years. Uh, uh, back in the 1960s, uh, Japan created this thing called the Deming Prize, which, uh, became the, uh, uh, which was a prize that was uh, uh, offered to uh, companies that were considered excellent in terms of uh, contributions to quality, producing good quality products and services and this kind of a thing. And with the Deming Prize, we began to develop methodologies to assess organizational competence systematically. Uh, later on, the United States, in a sense, copied the, the Deming Prize when they created the Baldrige Award back in the 1980s. 
Uh, back in the 80s, we also had the rise of something called ISO 9000. ISO stands for International Organization of Standards, and ISO 9000 is now the global standard for quality. Uh, we have uh, 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 in the software development area, in the, throughout the 90s, a very rapid growth of something called the Capability Maturity Model, which is trying to assess the uh, 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 competence of uh, organizations in delivering high-quality software products and so on. So over the last 30, 40 years, uh, we've gotten better and, and better at trying to uh, assess uh, effectiveness competence uh, of organizations. And uh, I think when we talk about organizational competence, uh, it should be clear what we're saying is, does the organization provide us with the infrastructure and the support we need as individuals and as teams uh, to do our jobs effectively? For example, uh, uh, if our projects involve using lots of equipment, do we have well-maintained uh, uh, equipment uh, that uh, uh, doesn't have to be state-of-the-art necessarily, but that's certainly uh, reflecting current good practice. If we're given uh, poorly maintained equipment or obsolete equipment, it's very hard to see how, even if the team is great and the individuals are great, it's hard to see how uh, you're going to have lots of project success in such an environment. Uh, does the organization, here's another issue of competence, promote uh, open thinking? Uh, does it uh, uh, try to promote people to think out of the box instead of having very narrow uh, tunnel vision thinking? Uh, does the organization uh, uh, permit people to criticize uh, uh, processes and things that they think are damaging uh, project performance? Or is everyone expected to just, if they see things are going wrong, uh, you just keep your eyes kind of averted, keep your eyes down? Uh, uh, keep your mouth shut, that's the way to get ahead. In that second environment where people got to keep their mouth shut and they're, they're afraid to, to uh, raise uh, issues, uh, uh, you have a disaster waiting to happen. So uh, uh, that's what we're talking about when we talk about organizational competence then, is having uh, organizations that create environments that allow the teams and individuals to operate effectively. If any one of those uh, uh, levels of competence are weak, then uh, it's going to be difficult to have uh, uh, consistent project success uh, in, 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 in that case. Uh, if the uh, organization isn't supporting individuals and teams, we just saw uh, that the teams and individuals can't do their jobs properly. If you have very smart people operating in good organizations who just don't believe in teamwork, you're going to have problems. Or if you have fundamentally a good supportive team structure and good organizations, but the individuals themselves really aren't qualified to do the project work, you're going to have troubles as well. Let's uh, take a look at what uh, many people broadly call project management professionalism. Uh, when we talk about project management professionalism, what we're saying is that uh, people who are on project teams and who are leading these teams, uh, if they're really going to be excellent in doing project work, have to view project management from a larger perspective. They have to have commitment uh, not just to uh, their organization, the entity in which they work, to do their job from 9 o'clock till 5 p.m., 9 a.m. till 5 p.m., get the job done and then come back and you can depend on me to be there uh, during, my, uh, during the work day. You have to, you have to go beyond that, uh, especially if you're going to excel in doing uh, project management work. And uh, you have to start looking at the broader issues of the profession itself. Now, the guardian of the project management profession uh, uh, is uh, to a large extent an organization called the Project Management Institute. Uh, PMI uh, is uh, uh, headquartered in the United States, but uh, it's uh, moving towards uh, being a more global organization. Uh, by the year 2003, it had over 105,000 members, uh, I believe, which is interesting. Uh, to think about because uh, back when 
uh, uh, I got active in the Project Management Institute in the late 1980s, uh, the total number of members we had would be between seven, eight thousand people. So uh, during the 1990s and into the early 2000s, uh, you can see there's been this tremendous growth of interest in project management as reflected just in the increasing size of the PMI, the Project Management Institute. Um, anyhow, uh, uh, PMI, uh, in order to maintain professionalism of the, uh, of, uh, of the profession, uh, has established a, a set of standards, project management standards, uh, which are now pretty much, uh, I think, acknowledged to be global standards for uh, project management uh, theory and practice. And the standards are captured in a work called A Guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. Okay, so it's called A Guide to the Project Management Body of Knowledge. And we all often just use a, a shortcut and we refer to it as the PMBOK. P-M-B-O-K, that's just abbreviation from the, uh, for the term Project Management Body of Knowledge. Incidentally, for those of you uh, who are, are familiar with the PMBOK, uh, I do want to point out that uh, in 1996, uh, when the, the new, a new edition of the PMBOK came out, we added, those of us uh, actively involved in the project management profession, uh, added the words, a guide to the, in front of PMBOK, uh, because previously uh, the, the, the PMBOK we just called the Project Management Body of Knowledge. And we said, well, it's, this is our body of knowledge. And then uh, some of the people on the Standards Committee at PMI recognized in the mid-1990s that the body of knowledge, the Project Management Body of Knowledge, is what resides in our collective heads as professionals in the project management uh, area. The body of knowledge is changing second by second. It's the collective insights, wisdom, experiences of all the hundreds of thousands of people who are leading project teams and, and managing projects. So at very best, what the Project Management Institute or any organization can do is try to create a road map okay, that allows people to have insights into the collective body of knowledge of the community. So that's why they call it a guide to the project management body of knowledge. We're not pretending that this document that's a couple of hundred pages long captures everything. And in fact, uh, the moment uh, a document is printed up and published and distributed, it's already becoming obsolete. So uh, uh, the very best uh, we can just capture, in a sense, a, a guide to the body of knowledge. We can't capture the body, body of knowledge itself. Okay, so uh, uh, anyhow, the PMBOK guide, as it were, uh, tells us that uh, project management, in structuring project management, uh, the project management discipline, uh, we can, uh, what we need to do is to, to uh, look at the structure along two dimensions. Actually, the, you can actually draw two dimensions, one going up and down uh, vertically, one going uh, horizontally. On the vertical dimension, you can identify five project management processes. The first of these five processes is called initiation processes. And uh, uh, what happens with these processes is that uh, we are concerned with prioritizing uh, various uh, 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 options that we're encountering in, in pursuing our projects. Uh, what we need to do is to sort through uh, our needs, our requirements, to try to determine what it'll take to uh, address these uh, needs and requirements, what kind of project solutions might be the best solutions to enable us to, uh, uh, to achieve the, uh, uh, our, our ultimate uh, needs and requirements, this kind of thing. Uh, one of the outcomes of the in initiation processes is we finally make a choice, we decide to, to pursue a particular project solution. Uh, the second process is called the planning process, and as the name implies, with the planning process is we get down to the nuts and bolts of things like scheduling, budgeting, allocating human and material resources. Uh, with planning processes, uh, we're heavily involved with dealing with uh, the well-known project management tools, such as cumulative cost curves, S-curves, such as uh, earned value, uh, well, I, it would be earned value management, 
uh, in establishing baselines, uh, PERT CPM scheduling uh, techniques, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, so uh, through, uh, through the planning process, what we try to do is establish what we call baselines, scheduled baselines, cost baselines, resource baselines, uh, which uh, provide us with the guidance we need to carry out our project. Uh, the uh, uh, third uh, uh, area, process area, is called uh, execution processes. And here we're talking about actually uh, executing the project, implementing the project, uh, doing what we said we were going to do uh, in the, uh, uh, when we were developing our project baselines, our project plans. Uh, what's interesting is even as you're executing, uh, going through the execution process, executing the plan, let's say, uh, you should be capturing information on what is actually happening. Okay, because that becomes very important when we go into the fourth uh, process area, which is control, controlling processes. When you talk about control and project management, what you're talking about is comparing uh, your baselines, what you plan to happen, with what actually happened. So during the execution processes, you gather data on what's actually happened. During uh, planning processes, you have baselines describing what should be happening. So with controlling processes, you examine the actual against the plan. And what you're looking for here are gaps between uh, the plan and the actual. Uh, if you encounter major gaps that seem to be uh, unattractive, uh, then one of the issues you have to contend with is, uh, uh, is it worth closing? Is this a serious issue? Is it worthwhile trying to close the gap? If we want to close the gap, what steps do we need to take to close the gap? The uh, fifth uh, process that uh, PMI identifies in its structuring of project management uh, discipline is uh, uh, close-out processes, and uh, what we're talking about here is bringing projects to uh, closure in a systematic, effective fashion. Uh, the kinds of things you should be concerned with when you close out a project are things like uh, have we reallocated resources properly? Uh, do, we, uh, have, have we, do we have customer satisfaction? Uh, have we conducted what we call a post-implementation review? That's very popular now, PIR post-implementation review to make sure uh, that we've learned the lessons that we hope to learn uh, from this project effort. So uh, taken together then, we have five processes and let me just summarize them. Uh, you have initiation processes, planning processes, execution processes, okay, controlling processes, and closeout processes. Now these five processes uh, are going to be matched or matched in the in the PMBOK against nine knowledge areas, and uh, in uh, this sounds more complicated than it really is. It's really not that complicated. We're talking about a simple matrix here that's five units high and nine units wide, and those nine knowledge areas represent uh, uh, PMI's best attempt to describe nine major competencies that project professionals should be uh, 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 familiar with. Okay, so let me go through these quickly. Uh, one of the nine knowledge areas is uh, uh, scope management. Scope management uh, means, uh, is referring to the knowledge that one has uh, that pertains to defining the overall scope of a project. Uh, uh, there's many tools that you can use in scope management that are useful. A work breakdown structure, WBS for example, is a scoping tool. It shows how the work is going to be divided for the overall project. Uh, you have things called scope statements, which are relatively short statements uh, that uh, define what it is that the project should achieve, under what constraints, this kind of thing. Uh, scope management is also concerned with uh, managing changes that occur during a project so you don't have scope creep. One of the big, big evils of project management is having something called scope creep where initially you've designed to build a horse and then with additions and changes and this and that that are out of control you wind up de developing a camel. So uh, 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 scope management is concerned with things like change control as well. 
Uh, a second uh, knowledge competency, a second uh, uh, knowledge area is uh, uh, time management. And this is the most famous uh, knowledge competency in project management, time management is. With time management, uh, we're dealing with the famous tools and techniques that we have in project management. Uh, these are the scheduling tools and techniques, PERT charts, cr uh, critical path method charts, uh, uh, Gantt charts, uh, milestone charts, earned value management techniques for, for maintaining, for planning and maintaining schedule control. Uh, to a large extent, uh, uh, those of us who work in project managers, management, are uh, uh, basically dealing with uh, the only truly non-renewable resource on a, uh, in the universe. Uh, time is the only truly non-renewable resource. When time is gone, it's gone. Uh, you cannot recover it. Uh, money can be recovered. Uh, if uh, something breaks, you can fix it, recover in that sense. But when time is gone, it's gone. So uh, uh, we're supposed to be the masters of managing time. And managing time today is very important. Uh, third knowledge-based competency is uh, uh, cost management. Uh, I call the cost management competency the Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci competency because it really covers a very broad array of, of things that people should know something about. For example, it, 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 uh, cost management uh, deals with a very important topic of uh, uh, cost estimation. On all of our projects, Remember, uh, we have, our project is unique. We're dealing with uncertainty, with risk. It's very hard sometimes to predict what it's going to cost to do the job. And uh, so you've got to be pretty good at cost estimating if you're going to develop plans that are realistic. Uh, so cost estimation. Uh, cost management includes a little knowledge of economics, understanding things like uh, uh, concepts like increasing returns to scale. Uh, learning economies, those kinds of things, the learning effect. Uh, it involves a little accounting. Uh, it involves understanding, for example, uh, 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 certainly doesn't hurt if you know what a balance sheet is. Uh, it doesn't hurt if you understand what a cash flow statement is, these kinds of things. Uh, these are the kinds of uh, uh, insights. Uh, if you have these insights, it'll help you do a better job in managing your projects, particularly if you're given responsibility for looking at the financials. Uh, it also involves uh, a little finance. Uh, if you have a project that's going to last for more than three or four months, you really should be, the cost data you're examining really should go through things like uh, present value analyses, discounted cash flow analyses. Uh, when you're trying to uh, assess uh, the merits of project A over project B, uh, one of the tools you should be looking at is internal rate of return. So these are some of the, some of the these are not difficult tools. So these are the kinds of things you can learn in a, in a classroom environment very quickly. Uh, the issue is, uh, uh, have, have project staff taken the effort to learn these tools, and, and then do they actually use these tools uh, once they're actually running projects? So uh, uh, cost management then uh, also has to do with budgeting, and it has to do with cost control. So that's our Leonardo da, Vin da Vinci uh, uh, co uh, competency area, knowledge-based competency area. Uh, a fourth uh, area that PMI has identified as a, as a key knowledge area is uh, what they call human resource management uh, knowledge. And uh, I think that title is probably a little off target. Most of us, when we use the term human resource management, are talking about things like personnel and employee, employee types of issues and job descriptions and so forth. And what uh, PMI really means when they refer to human resource management is the whole uh, issue of managing people. So uh, human resource management knowledge competencies involve you uh, uh, understanding things like uh, the theory and practice of conflict management, <clears throat> the uh, motivation theory and practice, uh, these kinds of things. Uh, now these first four competencies I mentioned, scope management, time management, cost management, and uh, people management have been basic project management competencies since uh, project management was first developed in the 1940s during World War II. Uh, if you talk to someone who was managing projects back in 1955 and said, these are the four competencies, knowledge competencies, effective project managers must possess, 
Okay, scope management, time management, cost management, people management. Back in 1955, they would have agreed with you completely. Uh, it's the next five uh, knowledge uh, areas that we're going to be adding to our list that show how project management has very much evolved with the changing, uh, with changes in management and the business environment. Okay, uh, uh, the fifth competency then is risk management. Uh, today, one of the pervasive realities of life is uh, life is filled with risk. Uh, we saw with the World Trade Center that the risk can be risk to uh, uh, risk of uh, bodily harm. Uh, we saw with the, you can see with the collapse of uh, of the stock market uh, that risk might be in the financial area. Uh, we saw with uh, Enron and uh, Global Crossing and with these other companies that there's the risk that because of unethical practices people may lose their jobs and pensions. Okay, and then on projects, our primary risk areas that we're concerned with are risks of slipping our schedule, uh, not meeting the specifications, and uh, having uh, cost overruns. So uh, if you're going to manage projects, you've got to know something about managing risk. Uh, the sixth area is quality management. And I think we all recognize that uh, uh, quality management uh, is uh, something that everyone's concerned with today. Uh, organizations that aren't perceived to deliver high quality goods and services are organizations that are going to go out of business. When we talk about quality management at PMI, we take the ISO 9000 perspective. And ISO 9000 says that quality has to be defined in terms of customer satisfaction. So ISO 9000, that perspective on quality, and this is the world standard, states that quality is what the customer says quality is. So uh, that's the approach that uh, we take at PMI. I think it's on target. It certainly re represents uh, current thinking on uh, quality management. Uh, another area, okay, the uh, 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 another area would be uh, contract and procurement management. Uh, PMI calls it procurement management. They used to call it contract management. But everything today is being outsourced. Everything is being done by people uh, on the uh, uh, on the outside. Uh, many of our organizations uh, fundamentally uh, are becoming contract contracting organizations, contracting out work. Uh, more and more work is being done by outsiders. Less work by our core staff. So uh, 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 with contract management, you need to know things like uh, uh, how do you put together uh, a solicit solicitation, okay? How do you invite people to bid on uh, something that you want, work that you want to be carried out? Uh, how do you actually evaluate the bids? If you're a contractor, how do you write a proposal? Uh, once an award is made, uh, what does it take to actually physically administer a contract? So these are some of the contract management issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, an eighth, eighth uh, knowledge area that PMI identifies is, I guess, I, I would argue it's probably the single most important of the uh, nine knowledge areas. It's communication management. Because in the final analysis, if, uh, if I'm a, a project manager and I can't communicate with my customer the need for customer support, if I can't communicate with my boss the need for management support, if I can't communicate with my team the need for them to do a good job and to uh, achieve the project goals, okay, if I can't communicate with my vendor what it is that I need and what I want, okay, if, if the communication breaks down, then all the other competencies don't amount to an awful lot. So uh, 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 basically, uh, effective project management, effective project professionals have to have uh, uh, pretty much a mastery of what communication is. Now, uh, communication occurs constantly in the life of a project manager. When you're making a briefing to the customer, you're communicating. Can you do it effectively? Do you focus on the right things? Uh, is your communication skill so bad that you're scaring the customer? Okay, you don't want that to happen. Uh, when you ask for resources and do a briefing to senior management, again, you want to communicate effectively. You don't want to give them too much information because you're inviting them to micromanage you. You don't want to give them too little information because they think uh, they'll be making decisions in a vacuum. Uh, and then again, with the project team members, if they're unhappy, remember many of these people are borrowed, uh, they don't want to be there, you have to communicate with them the importance of doing a good job and try to inspire them uh, to, to do the best job they can. 
The last competency, the ninth competency, or ninth, ninth knowledge area, is what uh, PMI calls integration management. Okay, fundamentally, integration management says, okay, we've identified eight other knowledge areas. What does it take to bring all these things together uh, to deliver uh, solutions effectively uh, to, uh, to our, our customers? So the ninth area is fundamentally uh, uh, focused on tying together everything so that we, we, we operate with all these different knowledge areas with, with, uh, without lots of conflict between them, without, uh, in software development we say with seamless interfaces, that's, that's the term we like to use. Now let's go back and take a look at how this uh, knowledge structure we've identified here, or this, this structure of the discipline applies to uh, helping us uh, be better uh, professionally. Uh, and uh, I'm going to start talking explicitly about something called the PMP examination. Okay, uh, the PMI certification examination leads to the conferring of something called project management professional status, PMP. So many people then just refer to the certification exam as the PMP exam. The, P, the, the uh, underlying uh, structure of the exam is tied to this five by nine matrix we just described. Uh, when people uh, at the Project Management Institute uh, on the certification committee are creating questions to put onto the certification examination, uh, what they're doing is they'll go into some of these cells. For example, they may go into, uh, let's say, the planning phase, and then they go into the cell that deals with uh, communication management. And they'll say, what kind of questions should we be asking on the PMP exam that deals with uh, 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 communications uh, issues during the planning stage? <clears throat> For example, uh, when we're planning our project, we need to communicate with functional managers to make sure resources are available that we can put into our plan. So let's ask some questions dealing with that particular uh, issue. So uh, uh, if you want to understand then what the PMP exam is all about, you have to understand the underlying uh, PMBOK uh, 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 structure okay, for defining the project management discipline. The exam itself is, uh, you can call it typically American, and I'm not sure that's a a compliment or a criticism, but it's a, it is typically American in the sense that it's a multiple choice examination. It has 200 questions and uh, uh, about uh, uh, close to 90% of the questions, I believe the last count showed that there was 89% of the questions focus on the, uh, 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 the three central uh, processes that I described before. Planning process, uh, execution processes and uh, 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 control processes. So when people are studying for the examination, uh, they should recognize that only something like 10 or 11 percent of the questions, and certainly a relatively small number of questions, deal with initiation and closeout processes. We're not saying that initiation and closeout aren't important for project management. What we're saying is that the exam doesn't address a lot of questions in that area. Uh, another thing, uh, the examination recently, in uh, uh, the beginning of the 2000s, began uh, asking questions dealing with uh, professional responsibility. Uh, professional responsibility, many people have taken to mean uh, ethics issues. And uh, uh, PMI, Project Management Institute, has a code of conduct. Uh, it has something called standards of conduct. and. Uh, uh, these, uh, uh, it, it, these are short documents and people who are part of the project management profession are expected to uh, have a good sense of, uh, uh, of what good ethical practice is in the context of project management. So there are a number of questions uh, on the certification exam dealing with uh, ethical and professional responsibility issues. Uh, one question I get a lot uh, from people who want to take the exam is uh, what is the uh, pass rate uh, on the exam and uh, 
uh, from the late 1990s through the early 2000s. Uh, my understanding, again these numbers may change and all that, uh, is that the pass rate is uh, the number of people who pass is somewhere around 77, more than 70 percent. Uh, so this says that the odds are in your favor, people who take the exam, uh, you have a, a reasonably good chance of passing it. Uh, obviously if you're going to pass it, you have to prepare for it, so you have to be prepared. <clears throat> Another question is, uh, when you take the exam, how many questions do you need to pass to get a passing grade? And uh, the answer here, uh, again, PMI is not fully uh, uh, straightforward about this, but by the best reckoning, it's about 70%. Again, about uh, 68, 69, 70 percent of the questions you need to get right. Uh, it's a 200 uh, questions on the exam, that means you want to get 140 or more right in order to pass the examination. Now, if you go through this whole process, uh, you uh, study for the exam, and the, it's very important in studying for the exam to thoroughly master the PMBOK guide, okay, to study that thing very carefully, but even then, you have to recognize that's not enough. Uh, there's a lot more knowledge on uh, uh, project management uh, than what's contained in the PMBOK guide. The PMBOK guide is a roadmap. It's a guide to the knowledge areas. It doesn't, it's not a comprehensive coverage. So uh, uh, you need to uh, do other study uh, as well beyond the PMBOK guide uh, to, in order to pass the exam. But if you haven't reviewed the PMBOK guide, I, I can't see how you could possibly uh, pass the exam. So if you pass the exam and you get a the PMP designation, uh, what, what does this mean? Well, uh, especially uh, multinational corporations uh, have really bought into the PMP exam concept. Uh, companies like AT&T, Motorola, Hewlett Packard, IBM, uh, companies like this uh, really encourage their project staff to, uh, uh, to get involved with the, uh, uh, the certification process and to go through the exam. Uh, even if your organization isn't supporting you in this area, uh, I think uh, you'll see that uh, uh, throughout the world uh, more and more people are recognizing that someone with the PMP is someone who certainly has good mastery of the project management knowledge competencies. Uh, I think uh, 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 what you uh, need to do is to look into uh, seeing whether uh, uh, something like this would help you professionally. Uh, most people will. As of the year 2002, there was something like 53, 54,000 people who had the PMP designation. Uh, so uh, look into it.